Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and this week we'll be talking with Ryan Crocker, one of America's most highly regarded diplomats to have ever served in the Middle East, including as ambassador to Iraq, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon, as well as Ambassador to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ambassador Crocker and I will be talking about Iraq, Iran, how the normalization agreements between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain may be changing the region, as well as what we might expect in the Middle East after the U.S. presidential election. Our conversation with Ambassador Ryan Crocker after this short break. What we need to stop doing is blaming Qatami uh, for a situation that he didn't create, but that we did. Um, it just means a need for strategic patience. And if there is one thing this administration is particularly bad at, it is, it is patience at, at any level. Um, uh, it, it almost sounds as though we're looking for an excuse uh, now that we've pulled out most of our troops to uh, pull out our embassy as well, uh, that would be incredibly irresponsible. I, I just can't underscore what that would do to um, our relationships, not just in Iraq, but around the Middle East. I do think there is scope, even for a second-term President Trump, um, to signal a shift. And in all fairness, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, the maximum pressure sanctions are are uh, really biting in Iran. Uh, uh, and again, to bear in mind that it was pressure that brought Iran to the table in the first instance, uh, the desire to, to escape international sanctions. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation, uh, to re-engage, but... Uh, uh, before batting up the Iranians, uh, talking to those that uh, signed the agreement with us under the Obama administration, again, beginning with our, uh, our NATO allies. That was Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who will be joining us momentarily. Now, I'm going to forgo my usual editorial in this segment and talk about Ryan's amazing career in the Foreign Service. As you all probably know, Ryan Crocker is renowned for exceptional diplomacy and reporting in unusually difficult and dangerous assignments, including early in his career in the 1980s in Lebanon. That's when the Sabra and Shatila massacre took place, when Hezbollah bombed our Marine barracks and the U.S. Embassy. Ryan was there. And then later in his career as ambassador to Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2002, Brian Crocker and then Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, William Burns, who, by the way, called Ryan, quote, one of the best officers I have ever known, unquote, wrote an internal memo at the request of Secretary of State Colin Powell about the possible negative consequences of the Iraq war. Crocker and Burns called the memo the perfect storm, and many of the consequences they anticipated actually played out in Iraq. Now, Ryan's caveats and concerns about U.S. policy in Iraq nonetheless gave him no pause in his willingness to serve there during the Iraqi Civil War. Indeed, Ryan's mark is service in those countries where the demands of the job were high risk, high pressure, and high priority for U.S. national security. President George W. Bush described Ryan as, quote, a remarkable diplomat and as a, quote, fearless man, widely regarded as the best foreign service officer of his generation. Ryan was ambassador to Iraq during the surge, working closely with General David Petraeus, and their partnership and the surge policy helped quell the Iraqi insurgency and civil war at that time. Now, what I've appreciated in knowing Ryan for more than 20 years and admiring his career has been how he so smoothly embraces the partnership 
between the Foreign Service, the military, and the sometimes shifting priorities of various administrations, most notably in Iraq and Afghanistan. This really best practice of civilian military partnership has led to high honors and recognition. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor in 2009, the inaugural Bancroft Award that's presented by the Naval Academy in 2016. He also received the West Point Association of Graduates 2020 Thayer Award, and he has been designated by the Corps as an honorary Marine. Ryan has also had a number of distinguished academic appointments. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a chair of the board of the RAND Center for Middle East Public Policy. And he's also been diplomat in residence at Princeton University, the inaugural Kissinger Fellow at Yale, the James Schlesinger Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Virginia, and Texas A&M, where he was Dean of the Bush School of Government. Our conversation with Ambassador Ryan Crocker begins now. Ambassador Crocker, welcome to On the Middle East. Well, thank you for having me. Let's start with Iraq. Now, you know the place better than just about anyone I can think of, having served there as ambassador during some of the darkest days after the toppling of Saddam Hussein. We now have a prime minister, Mustafa al Qadami, who is trying to implement overdue economic and security reforms and end the attack by rogue armed militias linked to Iran and bring all such militias, militias under the control of the state. Now, President Trump met with Qadami in Washington in August. The U.S. seems to want to help him, but the attacks still continue by these armed groups, including on our embassy and our people in Iraq. If you were still involved in Iraq policy, what would you advise the Trump administration? And what do you think would be the most effective diplomatic messages and policies that can be delivered at this time to help Qadami? Well, it's a great question. I'm very impressed with, with uh, Qadami. We've all known him over the years. He's a, uh, uh, a very solid, thoughtful Iraqi nationalist who uh, has always been a supporter of an active U.S. role. I, I don't think we can, you can ask for, for better than this. But it's also important to remember that uh, many of us thought the same thing about Adil Abdel Mahdi. Uh, uh, we used to console ourselves that he would be the best uh, prime minister that Iraq would never have. And then he, um, he got the job and he tried. Uh, it, it obviously did not succeed. So it, it's not gonna get better than this. Uh, if I was looking for Iraq as a responsible uh, member of the international community. Uh, the problem Kadmi has, of course, is that he is not um, he is not a free agent here. Uh, when we decided we didn't want to do Iraq anymore under the Obama administration, uh, we left an open playing field uh, for uh, uh, Islamic State and for Iran. Uh, Islamic State is gone for the moment, but the Iranians are still there. And uh, again, I, I, I do see Kadami as uh, an Iraqi nationalist, but he, he cannot control those militias um, unless Iran is going to agree that they be controlled. So what, what we need to stop doing is blaming Kadami uh, for a situation that he didn't create, but that we did. Um, it just means a need for strategic patience. And if there is... One thing this administration is particularly bad at is, it is patience at, at any level. Um, uh, it, it almost sounds as though we're looking for an excuse uh, now that we've pulled out most of our troops to uh, pull out our embassy as well. Uh, that would be incredibly irresponsible. I, I just can't underscore what that would do to um, our relationships, not just in Iraq, but around the Middle East. They had concluded in many cases, they couldn't really count on President Obama 
uh, in a crunch. Well, um, I think President Obama might be looking pretty good to them now. Uh, that uh, we're seeing what uh, some have called on the part of President Trump belligerent minimalism. Um, he talks fire and brimstone, uh, but basically he's he's heading for the exits everywhere he can uh, as a neo isolationist. Uh, American isolationism didn't make the world safer after World War One, to say the least, uh, and it won't do it this time around either. So um, the, the administration or the next administration needs to understand these problems were a long time in the making. There'll be a long time in the resolution. Uh, what we need to do is stay the course and uh, you know, back those who are probably supportive of positions we want to see taken. And that would be funny. Like he, uh, uh, he he does not have the uh, ability to shut down these attacks, and by labeling him as the problem, uh, uh, we are just making the situation worse. Ambassador, you were uh, you served in Iraq uh, while the embassy was under attack. How does a policymaker, decision makers in Washington, reconcile? the security threat with the national security interests you've just laid out in supporting Kadami? Well, this is a, um, again, part of a mess that the current administration helped to create with uh, uh, the Benghazi hearings under the Obama administration uh, when uh, in their desire to do damage to Hillary Clinton, uh, they produced a set of uh, kangaroo court hearings that has left the State Department uh, and everyone else uh, with the conviction that for this administration, um, you cannot lose a single life. Uh, if, if anybody gets killed anywhere, um, there's going to be a set of star chambers uh, aimed at ruining po uh, people's career. Look, in, in this world, uh, you cannot do effective American diplomacy in places where it is most needed unless you take some risks. Um, and sadly, uh, yeah, I, this has happened on my watch. Uh, I lost uh, an officer in Pakistan, in Iraq, and in Afghanistan. Uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, I had an understanding with the administrations that uh, we were, uh, the, the accountability review boards that uh, look into loss of life or substantial loss of property, that's a legislative requirement, but uh, uh, the review board did not come to post uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Right? Last thing I want to do is sound callous here. Uh, our, our, the lives of our officers, foreign service officers and staff, are immeasurably important. But you cannot do effective diplomacy if that's your top priority. If, if it's all about protecting the people who are out there and ensuring that nobody is hurt, uh, you're not going to be doing effective diplomacy. You've got to be ready to run some risk. And uh, that certainly is the way I looked at my uh, mission in Iraq as ambassador for two years. I had a few close calls of my own out there. Uh, but it's a, it was a wartime environment. Uh, we've got to be there for the war, uh, just as our brothers and sisters in uniform are. I, I've just come back from West Point, where I received their Thayer Award. Uh, and that was a topic of discussion, uh, uh, that uh, it, we have to be in a whole government approach. And that means that Everybody's got to run some risk out there uh, uh, if we're going to get the job done uh, for America, and we're talking American security. So uh, any loss is awful. Everything needs to be done reasonably to, to prevent that loss, uh, but you can't sacrifice uh, diplomacy uh, to a zero-sum casualty mentality. Uh, yeah, we cripple ourselves by doing it. And that's unfortunately what this administration set up uh, coming out of those uh, Benghazi hearings. Secretary Pompeo was a key element in those hearings. 
well, now you've got a result uh, that he has to live with, but um, uh, zero risk. Well, again, that makes it's absurd. Uh, it is no way for a great power to do business. Ambassador, you mentioned Iran, and uh, you are among a select group of American dip diplomats who have actually negotiated with Iran, including those linked to the late Qasem Soleimani and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. These were in the days after 9-11, and then I believe again as ambassador to Iraq, when, as we're, we've just been talking about, Iran was orchestrating attacks on our, our forces and diplomats. What have been your takeaways in such negotiations? And how would you advise the next administration, either Trump or Biden, both, uh, both President Trump and uh, Vice President Biden have talked about the potential for negotiations with Iran after the elections. Um, what's, how do you uh, assimilate your experience with Iran with what your expectations would be and advice would be in approaching Iran after November? Well, in, in my own case, it's a, a tale of two dramatically different negotiations. In uh, in Afghanistan, or about Afghanistan after 9-11, um, I, I had a series of meetings with Iranian officials, uh, starting in Geneva, uh, uh, really right after 9-11, and continuing there in Paris, uh, in New York, uh, during the General Assembly and in Kabul itself, when uh, my primary interlocutor surfaced in Kabul as uh, the Iranian ambassador, and um, I surfaced as the one opening the American embassy. We uh, met in um, Dr. Rahimi's offices on the UN compound, with uh, Dr. Rahimi conveniently absent. Uh, and we made some significant progress. Uh, the the success of the, uh, the bond conference in December of, of 01 owed a great deal to the, uh, uh, the, the efforts of both the United States and Iran to fashion an interim authority that to, could enjoy broad support. Uh, that all came to an end uh, after State of the Union 2002, in which Iran was linked to North Korea and uh, Iraq as the famous axis of evil. But the talks to that point had produced some significant understandings or actions uh, and held out the promise of a recalculation uh, in the first census by Qasem Soleimani, uh, his, his view of the US. Um, that uh, of course did not then come to pass. Fast forward, the uh, talks in Baghdad in 2007, early 2008, I, I knew those were going nowhere. Um, uh, the uh, Iraqis had their own delegation there, uh, headed by Prime Minister Maliki. Uh, uh, we met um, several times at my level and other times at uh, kind of a working level there to see if there was any grounds for um, uh, agreement. Again, going into it, I knew there wasn't. And uh, by the end of, by the beginning of 2008, clear all the way around that the Iranians were not going to be persuaded to drop their support for uh, militia groups, uh, that uh, it was just a futile to go on. But here's the thing uh, that I didn't realize until a couple of months later. Failed negotiations can also have positive outcomes. In this particular case, the failure uh, to persuade the Iranians to stop supporting Maliki's rivals led Maliki to the decision uh, that produced charge of the night. The, uh, uh, the Iraqi security forces engagement of primarily Sadrists, but others as well, all the way from Basra to Baghdad. Uh, he, he would not have done that, I think, if he had been not been persuaded that there was no point talking to these guys. Um, uh, you have to use force. So in, in that sense, I mean, for 
diplomats of the future, it's, it, it's worth studying when negotiations fail uh, and how that can actually lead to your own advantage. If Joe Biden wins the presidency, he's talked about returning to the Iran nuclear deal, but perhaps adding that there could be some improvements to the deal in subsequent negotiations. Iran has officially said they want no part of any revisions to the Iran deal. And in fact, they want an apology and compensation for the sanctions uh, that have been imposed during the the, the Trump administration. Uh, would you be uh, hopeful that a negotiation can be worked out? And I should say that the, President Trump has also said he wants a, a negotiation uh, with Iran, and he has had the diplomatic door uh, open throughout his presidency, even as he has imposed uh, maximum pressure sanctions and walked away from the Iran deal. How do you see negotiations on an Iran nuclear deal, no matter who wins the U.S. election? In the first instance, uh, I would I would suggest it is not about talking to Iran. It is about talking to our um, our former partners. Uh, it's we need to bear in mind that the um, JCPOA was not a U.S. Iranian uh, bilateral agreement. It was the P5 uh, plus Germany, and I think we need to go back to those countries, starting obviously with our allies. Uh, uh, to see what kind of approach we might put together. Uh, this, this is one of those cases where I think we do not want to uh, go alone. And the irony, of course, is that uh, after Trump took office, the, uh, several of the signatories of that agreement said uh, that they would be quite willing to support a new round of negotiations on issues such as the Iranian ballistic missile program. Uh, which Trump just rejected right out of hand. Uh, so there was a certain irony after the killing of Qasem Soleimani. Uh, uh, those ballistic missiles uh, became more of a threat. They were actually uh, fired at our bases. Miraculously, no one was killed. Uh, so I, I do think there is scope, even for a second term President Trump, um, to signal a shift. And in all fairness, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, the maximum pressure sanctions are are uh, really biting in Iran. Uh, uh, and again, to bear in mind that it was pressure that brought Iran to the table in the first instance, uh, the desire to, to escape international sanctions. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation. Uh, to re-engage, but uh, uh, before dialing up the Iranians, uh, talking to those that uh, signed the agreement with us under the Obama administration, again, beginning with our, uh, our NATO allies. The Trump administration has brokered normalization agreements between Israel and the UAE and Bahrain. Uh, these seem to be a big deal. You know that uh, these types of agreements in the region are, are quite difficult and rare. Uh, how do you assess these accords and are they positive for U.S. policy and interests in, in your analysis and, and for regional stability? And how do you see the impact on the Israeli-Palestinian track? I, I think these agreements are significant. I, I know that some commentators have played them down uh, saying, for example, that uh, all this did was just put the signatures on paper that the coordination in particular between the UAE and Israel had been extensive and of, of, um, of relative long standing. Um, well, no, there is a difference. Uh, there is most definitely a difference. Uh, by, by the success in these negotiations, uh, the Trump administration doubled the number of Arab countries at, formerly at peace with um, with Israel from two to four, um, and uh, I I think that is highly significant. It, it's also interesting to try to speculate what is behind the scenes, if you will, uh, with the uh, the UAE and particularly what it means for Saudi Arabia. Hard for me to read that with the UAE. They they have been very close to the Saudis at times. Uh, uh, this is a time of 
I think, fairly significant strain in, engendered by the um, uh, the conflict in Yemen. Uh, it's clearer to me in the case of Bahrain. You know, Bahrain has had to depend, literally depend, on uh, Saudi Arabia to ensure that the ruling family has been able to um, hang on to power there, trying to rule over a, a, a Shia uh, majority. Uh, so given given that need the Bahrainis have for Saudi protection, an existential issue, um, I can't think, I can't believe that the Bahrainis would have come to a formal agreement with Israel without being sure they had a green light from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that, of course, would lead leads to the speculation, is Saudi Arabia going to, going to be the next to sign? I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Uh, but we are in a different place than than uh, than we had been previously, and it's again, if you remember uh, back at the beginning of the Trump administration, his first visit to the Middle East was to Saudi Arabia. The second country he visited was Israel, and, and for the first time, Air Force One could file a uh, a flight plan in Riyadh direct to Tel Aviv. Always had to go through this charade before filing to a third country and then refiling once they were out of Saudi airspace. Not only did the Saudis let us uh, file directly, they had no problem with us publicizing it. Uh, so things are moving. Uh, I think these agreements are important and I hope that they will be uh, built on further with other, other Arab states coming forward. Now, impact on the Palestinians, that's another matter. Uh, uh, that uh, in the wake of the move, <coughs> the move of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, where nothing happened. Uh, there was no broad negative reaction throughout the region. That may come later, could still come. Um, and then you have now these, uh, these formal peace agreements. Some have said, well, this is a betrayal of the Palestinians. Well, well let's, let's be frank here. Uh, the Palestinians have been betrayed early and repeatedly by their Arab brothers. Um, uh, the, one of the sadder things in the region, in my view, is the way the Palestinian cause um, has been used by Arab countries uh, in, a, in very cynical ways that have nothing to do with um, the creation of an enduring Palestinian state. So to the degree that these peace agreements uh, are seen as being signed completely irrespective of Palestinian uh, interests and the Palestinian future, uh, in, a, in an odd way, it may have a positive effect. But, uh, the Palestinians are, are going to have to make their own deal with, uh, with the Israelis, and the Arabs are going to let them do it. Um, it's going to require several things. Most importantly, frankly, it's going to be a, a new leadership for the Palestinians. Uh, uh, I, I would say that in terms of an, uh, an adversary, if not an enemy list, uh, perhaps enemy number one for the Palestinians has been the other Arab states. Enemy number two has been their own leadership. Uh, you know, a, a uh, they distinguished themselves with the three no's of the 1967 uh, cartoon Arab summit, and they've been saying no pretty much ever since. Uh, it, it, it's a time for a new leadership to take over uh, that might perhaps reach out to Europe, to France in the first instance. Macron's been very active in the region. Um, but to, to, to start having a positive approach, that doesn't mean uh, uh, conceding everything or indeed anything. But uh, I, I would see this step of Arab states to uh, recognize I Israel, irrespective of situations in the Palestinian territories, as almost a liberating step for the Palestinians. Uh, but it's going to take new leadership to take advantage of that. Uh, and uh, it's probably going to take new leadership in Israel, too. Uh, but it, it is, I think there is a moment here. Uh, that, that is not going to be captured at all by, by the, uh, the current Palestinian leadership. What is your assessment of where we are in Syria 
and advice for U.S. policy there? Well, we've been, um, we've, in, in some respects, we've been quite fortunate uh, in that we did not get what um, President Obama was calling for, uh, which was a new leadership in, um, in Damascus. Uh, had that come about, uh, I do not think we would like the results. It, it would have been, um, if, if, the, if Sunni groups had seized power, uh, we could be looking at a really dangerous state uh, affiliated with Islamic State uh, slash Al-Qaeda. Uh, uh, if, you know, to say Assad must go, uh, as, as President Obama did, uh, to me at least, uh, reflected a president not really in command of um, the particular currents and realities inside Syria. Frankly, not that I would expect him to be. That's not what presidents have time to do, but I certainly would have expected more from his advisors. Um, you know, it, uh, there was that little um, misunderstanding in Hama in early 1982 um, <clears throat> when the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood was, was cornered in, in Hama and uh, the defense companies under the command of uh, Hafez al-Assad's brother Rifat pretty well eliminated them uh, by eliminating about 20,000 Sunni civilians in the center of the city. Uh, the uh, the regime knew that someday there might be a reckoning after that, and they built the perfect security state to be able to withstand it. Uh, so in the first instance, uh, Assad must go, yeah, well, not right away, guys. Uh, they were ready for it. And uh, no surprise either that uh, they called them their friends, and that their friends, Iran and Russia, uh, came to their support. Uh, we should be grateful to the Iranians and, and the Russians. Uh, by keeping Assad in, uh, they kept Islamic State out. Uh, so we were we were messed up from the beginning. Uh, so we didn't get what we asked for, thank goodness. Now I, I think you've, you've got a time to uh, again talk to uh, talk to other actors. Um, uh, nobody is sitting terribly pretty right now not the uh, not the Russians not the Turks uh, Israelis are worried about it uh, the Iranians have expended a huge amount in uh, in treasure and in blood and they haven't got a lot of loose change uh, so again I don't think anyone's comfortable with the status quo it's whether uh, creative American diplomacy might produce other approaches I one of the one of the things I regretted very much is that uh, when Stefan de Mastura uh, uh, had the uh, Syria portfolio for the United Nations, that we didn't make more of an effort then to uh, put weight into the Geneva process that he was heading. We don't find many Stefan de Masturas out there, uh, regrettably. Um, and I, I do think that uh, uh, to move this in any positive direction, it's going to require uh, UN involvement, at least uh, uh, as a uh, as a cover. So uh, I, I think that what we need to do again is first realize Syria isn't over uh, by any means. I mean, I, I see this as a fairly prolonged lull between different phases of an ongoing fight. Um, that uh, Idlib did not turn out to be. Uh, the the Alamo for the, uh, uh, the Sunni insurgents they've managed to hang on in there. Um, so it'd be a great time after the election to uh, kind of take a new look at all of this. And again, talking to others who are um, who are involved there. One concern I think I had was that you had so many different players, including foreign nations, not just groups, uh, uh, running around in Syria, the danger of a, an unintended consequence that could lead to regional conflict was pretty high. When that Israeli F-16 went down, thank goodness those 
uh, pilots uh, were not killed and that the, uh, the, the plane and its pilots uh, came down in Israel, that could have sparked a confrontation nobody wanted. So uh, again, for point one, Syria is not over. Um, point two, we need to talk to the various players and see if we can, uh, working together, fashion an approach that might um, lead to further limits on the conflict. Um, and most importantly, to, to continue by whatever means we can, and I think we need to be pretty quiet about it, uh, to ensure the Kurds don't pay a terrible price for their support uh, of our efforts against ISIS. Uh, Trump almost left them completely in the lurch. Uh, I think that has calmed down a bit, but uh, we, we owe those folks something. It's certainly not an independent Kurdish state in Syria, uh, but we have obligations there too. How, as ambassador and a practitioner of U.S. foreign policy, how do you manage the tension between human rights and the need to conduct business, security business, commercial business with governments such as Egypt and Saudi Arabia, among many in the region and elsewhere in the world, who are also valuable U.S. partners while also raising concerns about human rights practices? It's a dilemma for, for all of us in, in the American Foreign Service. Uh, as you rightly point out, it is a case of uh, conflicts between um, interests and values. Uh, uh, and we see it over and over. I, I guess I have, over the years, come to be of the view that um, what does not advance either our values internationally um, or our national security interests uh, is um, issuing ultimatums to otherwise friendly governments that unless they do X, Y, and Z um, on the human rights front, we're done. Uh, we're walking away. Uh, whatever programs we got going are going to come to an end um, and you'll be on your own. It, that kind of um, extortion, if you will, I don't think would ever work. Um, such countries would see this as further proof of an unreliable sometimes ally um, and also see the steps that we were demanding as being inherently threatening to uh, their very rule, meaning uh, we might feel good for the moment, but we will have advanced again neither our national security interests uh, nor the cause of human rights in um, in a given country. There have been occasions when there's been a a convergence where our our, our values and our interests coincide. Uh, for me, that was in Afghanistan, which I consider. Uh, uh, part of the greater Middle East, where coming in after the Taliban, they made an immediate effort uh, to bring girls and women back into society. I, I, I opened the embassy there. I remember my first congressional visitor was um, uh, then uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Joe Biden. And I, I took him in January of 02 to a, a girls' primary school and visited a first grade class, uh, you know, that had girls of six years of age and girls of 12 years of age. Uh, I asked one of the 12 year olds whether it bothered her or embarrassed her to be in a uh, class with uh, kids literally half her age. And she just smiled at me and said, she didn't care who else was in class. She cared that she was in class. And we continued to, to uh, basically saying to the Afghan females, look, uh, go to school. Go to universities, become teachers and professors, go into politics, run for the national, for the parliament, uh, uh, go into business, join the military, and we got your backs. Except we don't have their backs anymore. Effectively, we are saying to the uh, the Afghans, adversaries and allies, both, we're done. Um, uh, we're going to go down to zero on our troops, and uh, you're on your own. And gee, uh, uh, we know we made a lot of promises to Afghan females, uh, but look at the time we got to be going. So, goodbye and good luck. 
So even there, where I, I saw a real convergence of values and interests, uh, we're, we're walking away from those values. And Afghan females will literally get it in the neck as a result. You've um, come out in support of uh, Joe Biden for U.S. president. Could you tell us um, a little about your your thinking behind uh, that support and in terms of specifically what it means for U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, how you think the outcome of the U.S. presidential election will shape and impact the direction of our policies in this region? Well, I've known, um, I've known the former vice president uh, for quite a number of years, and I, I've also known the people around him. I think like um, many of us uh, who have made careers in government service, you, uh, you learn to measure a principle uh, by the people around him uh, or her. And I've always felt that the, the inner circle uh, for Joe Biden uh, has been made up of uh, individuals of, um, of high quality, of ability, of integrity, uh, and uh, who are uh, also nice people to be with. Not, not, not a whole lot of abrasives on the part of the, uh, the Biden team. And they've, they've hung with him for years and years and years. Uh, uh, that, that to me is important. I, I think he's got a team around him who, who, who know how to get stuff done. And for the vice president himself, uh, uh, he's, he's an old school internationalist, uh, considerably more so than President Trump, obviously, but also more so than uh, uh, President Obama. He, he believes the U.S. should lead in the world, that uh, uh, that U.S. leadership has been a force for good over time, uh, and that we should continue to do so. Uh, so uh, is he going to uh, completely reverse the this trend, this neo-isolationism? Well, certainly not on day one. Uh, he's, he's got to take into account the mood of the American people. And I think uh, actually his, his first efforts uh, will need to be at home. I mean, explaining exactly why it is that international engagement and U.S. leadership on the international level is in our long-term interests. I, I have no doubt it is. But um, uh, we, he would need to make that case. And, um, and proceed from there. So for all those reasons, I, I think uh, for, for certainly for those of us who believe that post-World War II American leadership uh, was overall highly positive and that the dangers of the U.S. failing to lead are pretty extreme, uh, it was an easy, easy choice for me to make. Ryan, how has the tradecraft of diplomacy changed and not changed over the past few decades during your career, including the advances in communication, the impact of media and social media, the increased frequency of international travel, and how has this all influenced the work of foreign service officers? Well, certainly there have been um, uh, dramatic developments in communications technology. I mean, the, the really golden old days, um, when um, your instructions came to you by sailing ship, um, meaning you could probably do any darn thing you wanted. Uh, 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 we are now in a, a, an era where you have instantaneous communication with, um, uh, with Washington, whether you want it or not. Uh, but all of that said, um, it, it, it's, and here's something that's been said, uh, by many, and I think accurately, it's the last three feet that count uh, when you're delivering an instruction or making a point or a request. It's the uh, it's it's what happens when you get in the room where it happens uh, uh, that that really counts. Uh, the personal relationships I think are just as important as they always have been. Um, getting to know your adversaries and your allies in a given country. Uh, that only comes through savvy diplomacy by foreign service officers who know what they're doing. Um, and uh, in that sense, I find it 
has always been a highly gratifying profession. Uh, there have been changes, though, of course, and I, I think it's given the places I've served, it's uh, clearest to me. Uh, it's um, uh, the importance of the United States military uh, as a factor in the international arena, not only for kinetic force. Uh, I've seen over the years that um, uh, the role of our military and the weight and leverage our military can bring uh, uh, have have made a difference. It, uh, we as a service, we need to get to know uh, better than we do now um, who our military counterparts are, why they are where they are, what is their culture, um, what, what, what drives them, what do they seek, what do they try to avoid, and so forth. Uh, military is a you know, a little bit more effective in getting to know us than um, uh, us getting to know them. And, and I, I really think we've got to take further strides in that development. Uh, much talk about the militarization of foreign policy. Uh, to the extent that that is true, it's not the military that's doing it. Uh, it is policymakers who decide that um, time to send in the 101st. Um, uh, in many cases, the those who are most against a military intervention uh, are the military themselves, because they know they will pay the price. Uh, so as we move forward in a, uh, uh, a more decentralized world, uh, I think we have to take fuller account of uh, uh, the uses and misuses of uh, uh, American military presence in political affairs. I mean, this, is not new, it goes back to von Clausewitz. Uh, but I, I do think we need to um, uh, uh, work a bit harder to be sure that we um, that we understand our military brothers and sisters and that they understand us. Um, I have always found senior commanders ready to listen to political advice, um, and even more so on the development side, where they may have vast sums of money to spend as they did in Iraq, but no real understanding of how to spend it that's not part of their training so it's figuring out where we can help each other for a um, a um, you know a common goal of, of, of furthering their national interest a lot has been done uh, i think the phenomenon is going to continue as far as i can see uh so it's, it's a great time to get to know again those who wear the uniform a bit better than we already do Ryan, thank you for joining us today on on the Middle East. And as a, a friend and admirer of your career, thanks for all you've done to advance U.S. interests and values in this region. And uh, may I return the compliment, Andrew? Uh, you, uh, whether it was up on the hill or um, uh, what you're doing now, running El Monitor, you've uh, contributed a great deal to. Uh, to the national interest and in particular the national understanding. Thank you very much. Appreciate it and really enjoyed our conversation today. So did I, Andrew. Be well. We will be right back with some closing remarks after this short break. I'm Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor veteran columnist reporting from Israel, one of the world's major news and action suppliers of all times, comparing to its tiny size. I've been covering and analyzing the political, diplomatic, and military arenas in Israel for over 34 years. My best-selling biography, The Netanyahu Years, was out two years ago. I covered seven prime ministers, one major war, two intifadas, one prime minister's assassination, two and a half peace treaties, four military operations in Gaza, and it's not letting up anytime soon. I am glad to invite you to On Israel, our brand new podcast, where we will discuss major events in Israel and its surroundings, talk to decision makers, leaders, and analysts, and try to understand the chaos that comes with the territory of Israel and the Middle East. You will never have a dull moment with us. See you soon here on Israel Al Monitor. Welcome back. Many takeaways from our conversation with Ryan Crocker today. And just to mention a few here. First, that dealing in the Middle East is a long game. 
He said many of the challenges the U.S. faces in the region are a long time in the making and a long time in the resolution. We need to stay the course and back our allies, such as Prime Minister al Qadami in Iraq. Second, his articulation of the tension between interests and values in U.S. foreign policy. He really nailed it. And especially when he said what doesn't work is blustery ultimatums to allies and partners, which advance neither interests nor values. And he also talked about the need to seize the opportunity when interests and values do converge, as in support for education for women and girls in Afghanistan after the U.S. deposed the Taliban, and the need to stay engaged to see these types of changes through in countries. Finally, I very much appreciated Ryan Crocker's take on the fluidity of diplomacy and the military in U.S. national security policy, much more nuanced and accurate than commentary that bemoans the militarization of foreign policy. His walking the walk on this partnership between diplomats and the military has been a hallmark of his career. Thank you all for listening to On the Middle East. We will be back next week. And in the meantime, please sign up for this and our other All Monitor podcast on Israel at your favorite podcast platform. Thank you.